Good evening those new to my channel, and returning macabros, and welcome to the third installment in my One Fatal Flaw series. This series aims to discuss films that I argue suffer tremendously from a single writing directorial decision. That is not to say that this is the only flaw in the entire film, nor do I mean to say said flaw makes the film a complete and utter crapshoot, but rather the particular flaw significantly reduces the quality of the film and or prevents it from becoming far more effective and or thematically brilliant than it already may be. Today we will discuss Jordan Peele's 2017 satirical horror film, Get Out, which tells the story of black photographer Chris, played by Daniel Kaluuya, who accompanies his white girlfriend Rose to meet her white as fuck parents for the first time. But soon it becomes apparent that Rose and her family have far more insidious intentions for bringing Chris out into the middle of nowhere, namely auctioning him off to be used as a vessel to a white man named Jim Hudson, who wishes to inherit Chris's gift for photography by transferring his brain into Chris's body and condemning Chris to the horrific fate of the sunken place. What was so refreshing about Get Out was that, while the vast majority of narratives that deal with racism usually deal with its more clearly vitriolic and hateful face, via loud and proud bigots or white supremacists, Get Out showcases another, and I would argue more insidious form of racism, the sort that hides behind a seemingly harmless demeanor, a kind smile, and a plethora of cringe-inducing, woke comments such as, By the way, I, I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could. While the horror genre, especially in its heyday, has always had a tight-knit relationship with politics, over the last couple decades, it seems that the social commentary found in classic films such as Night of the Living Dead, Videodrome, and of course the myriad of teen slasher films of the 1970s and 1980s has, outside of the occasional shining exception, taken a backseat to more straight-up, hammy, jump-scare-filled affairs, and, unfortunately, it seems that the horror genre has been written off by many as one in which high art is not to be found. That was until the release of Get Out, whose critical acclaim and awards praise led to a re-evaluation of the horror genre as one that should be taken seriously, an attitude that hopefully will lead to the genre being given the respect it deserves. However, while the film is a masterpiece of contemporary satirical horror, balancing the genres in no less than an expert fashion, as many who frequent this channel know, most likely due to my frequent discussion of a particular fantasy television series, the ending is more often than not the make or break point, where a mediocre film can be redeemed, where a great film can become subpar. And while the ending of Get Out is by no means a detriment to the film as a whole, director Jordan Peele truly had the chance to solidify his tale as one of the most brilliant of recent cinema. Had he gone with, So as those of you who have seen the film know, the film ends with Chris escaping the clutches of the sinister Armitage clan and being rescued by all-time Hall of Fame number one bud, Rod, a sequence that is perhaps one of the most satisfying in recent memory. Take note of the word satisfying, as I will come back to that later. However, those of you who have seen the film may not be aware that there were several other endings proposed, one of which would see Chris being brainwashed by the Armitages in the finale of the film. However, there is one particular ending that is not simply referred to as an alternate ending, but by Jordan Peele himself, as the original ending, an ending that was fully filmed and can even be found in the script itself online. While in the theatrical ending, as Chris is strangling Rose, Rod appears and whisks Chris away to safety, the original ending shows two police officers arriving on the scene and arresting Chris. Since the Armitage house was set ablaze during Chris's escape sequence, all the evidence of the Armitage family's horrific brain transplant experimentation went up in smoke, and Chris is arrested as the police most likely just assume he killed the Armitages in cold blood. The final scene shows Rod visiting Chris in jail, and while he most likely will be incarcerated for the rest of his life, he is given a slight sense of relief knowing that no one else will succumb to the evil will of the Armitage family. Jordan Peele explains the intention of the film's original and far more bleak ending. In the beginning, when I was first making this movie, the idea was, okay, we're in this post-racial world apparently. That was the whole idea. People were saying like, we've got Obama so racism is over. Let's not talk about it. It's a wrap. That's what the movie was meant to address. These are all clues, if you don't already know, that racism isn't over. So the ending in that era was meant to say, look, you think race isn't an issue? Well, at the end, we all know this is how this movie would end right here. The original ending was meant to highlight one of the 
the most pressing realities of race relations in the current USA, particularly regarding mass incarceration. While crime rates in the black community are disproportionately high, especially in more urban, densely populated areas, which in turn leads to a higher incarceration rate, this is a direct result of the racial disparities found in almost every facet of our socioeconomic and judicial systems, which have created a vicious cycle of crime and punishment that more often than not leaves primarily minority groups in its path of destruction. In Get Out, it is the Armitage family who forces Chris into the situation he finds himself in in the film's conclusion. And though it was their actions that forced Chris into fighting back in order to escape, it is he who, in the end, is punished for it. While many black Americans are caught in a system that kicks the legs out from under their chairs at almost every turn, rampant systemic oppression is rarely acknowledged and addressed as the root cause by the powers that be. And more often than not, it is the victims of said oppression who are the ones who pay the cost. As for why he opted to pass on the social commentary-fueled original ending, Peel cites the numerous cases of black men being killed by police officers and the resulting civil unrest surrounding production of the film. It was very clear that the ending needed to transform into something that gives us a hero, that gives us an escape, gives us a positive feeling when we leave this movie. According to Peel, test audiences did not respond well to the original ending. For reference, just check out the comments in response to the original ending here on YouTube. In Peel's eyes, given the dour and horrifically depressing reality many people of color were dealing with at the time of the film's release, he wanted the film's ending to serve as a form of catharsis, as a triumphant moment where the hero, in the end, is given a glimmer of hope and happiness. You know, this actually reminds me of a similar case that occurred 30 years before the release of Get Out. In 1985, director Terry Gilliam released what is arguably his finest work, the brilliant science fiction dystopian satire Brazil, a film that, while it is not a direct adaptation, was heavily inspired by George Orwell's classic novel about the dangers of totalitarianism 1984. Brazil tells the story of the mild-mannered Sam Lowry, a feeble employee of his society's ultra-authoritarian bureaucracy. After a series of mishaps lead to Sam becoming involved with a woman named Jill Layton, the girl quite literally of his dreams, and a suspected terrorist named Archibald Tuttle, played by a refreshingly non-typecast Robert De Niro, Sam begins to push back against the stranglehold of the government and dreams of escaping its clutches. But this fantasy is short-lived as Sam and Jill are caught and Sam is condemned to be tortured. However, Sam is miraculously saved by none other than Tuttle and makes his escape. In the end, Sam finds himself driving away from his oppressors with Jill by his side and the two lovers begin their new life together as the film comes to an end. Well, at least that is how the film would have ended had president of distributor Universal Studios, Sidney Scheinberg, had his way. Scheinberg had, unbeknownst to Gilliam, originally commissioned a second editing team to work on the film and give it an upbeat ending. After an infamous battle between artist and studio, Universal eventually agreed to release Brazil with the director's intended ending, which while it does have Sam escaping and him and Jill riding off into the sunset together, well, then this happens. It is revealed that Sam's escape and his reuniting with Jill was merely a fantasy brought about by either a lobotomy or his own self-induced insanity. The film ends with Sam alone in the cavernous torture chamber, reveling in his freedom within the confines of his own mind. Like its inspiration 1984, the film ends on a dour note, with our hero being crushed beneath the heel of the establishment. However, I would argue this was not a case of a film having a soul-crushing ending simply for the sake of having one, but like, with many great works of satire, to serve as a cautionary tale, a call to action if you will. Stories like 1984 and Brazil that feature the oppressive nature of a hyper-totalitarian society are meant to instill in the audience an anger. The gut-punch ending of Night of the Living Dead, where protagonist Ben, played by Dwayne Jones, survives the dead, but is nonetheless killed in the film's conclusion, was meant to serve as a parallel to the assassinations of prominent black figures during the time of its release, highlighting the realities of race relations 
in the 1960s. The grim fate of James Woods in David Cronenberg's Videodrome was meant to highlight the danger that mass media, particularly television programming, presents to the public. Satire, at its best, aims to use exaggeration, whether hilarious or horrific, or in the cases of Brazil and Get Out, both hilarious and horrific, to act as a wake-up call to the audience, to make them ensure that their reality, under no circumstances, comes to resemble that of the story. And this brings us back to Get Out. In the tradition of these satirical classics, Get Out's original ending would have been quite the depressing conclusion. Peel decided, given the social climate surrounding the release of the film, to give the film a more optimistic ending, to give the audience the catharsis they yearned for. As I mentioned, the comments below the original ending on YouTube all concur that they would have hated to see Chris get arrested and it would have been infuriating and would have made them pissed off and angry and enraged. But then again, wasn't that the entire point behind the original ending? Like with the other stories I have mentioned, the original ending would have shown the harsh realities of the world with the intent of driving the audience to take action to prevent it from happening any longer. Something that, especially given the social climate surrounding the film's release would have been a case of a film perfectly tapping into the current zeitgeist and demonstrating the anger that so many people of color across the nation were instilled with. Aside from the thematic resonance the original ending holds, from a plot perspective, you can actually see how the original ending also seems to clear up one of the more lingering questions following the end of the film. Namely, how the hell is Chris supposed to walk away from this situation a free man? Surely the police will eventually come knocking once they find the Armitage house burned to the ground, considering his connection with Rose and the fact he was stopped by a cop in the film's opening. Of course, this issue is answered in the original ending since, well, Chris was never supposed to get away at all. Not really a big deal, but it does force the viewer to suspend their disbelief in order to frame the ending as one that is wholly happy. Now, while I find the original ending to be the absolute pitch-perfect conclusion to the tale, one which would have made it an automatic contemporary classic, it isn't exactly fair to compare Peel's directorial decision to say that of Gilliam's. Regardless of the fact that downer endings are a harder sell no matter what, Peel also had to keep in mind of what was going on around him, namely the hopelessness and despair many were feeling as a result of what they perceived to be a lack of accountability for those in power. Peel wanted the ending to be, rather than a gut punch, a sigh of relief he could give the audience to perhaps allow them to momentarily escape from the harsh reality on their city streets, something that I think is quite understandable. And that is not to say the theatrical ending was not superior in its own way. I would argue the theatrical ending perfectly executes the conclusion of Rod's subplot and ends the film with perhaps one of the greatest final lines of recent memory. I'm T.S. motherfucking A. However, it is not surprising that many prefer the theatrical ending as they find it more comforting and satisfying. But once again, this seems to be quite antithetical to what the best of satire aims to do, to make the audience uncomfortable, to frustrate, to challenge, to illuminate truths that the audience would rather not have to face. While I understand Peel's sensitivity to minority groups who themselves don't need to be reminded of the harsh truths and realities they face on a daily basis, I would argue for the portion of the audience who maybe don't face the realities that the film brings to light on a daily basis, there was a sorely missed opportunity to show them the harsh truth of our society, to make them a bit uneasy, to not give them the comfort of believing that discrimination is simply a matter of individual bigotry, but rather systemic oppression. People of color in this country are not just facing off against a handful of cheating players, they are themselves caught on the grasp of a rigged game, a concept that I argue the original ending of the film illustrates beautifully. All in all, while the theatrical ending in no way diminishes the film in and of itself and maintains it as an excellent piece of satirical horror, I believe that had Peel gone with the original ending, the film would over time become to be seen as one of the all-time greats of the genre, elevating it to the other timeless masterpieces I have mentioned elsewhere in this video. A sorely missed opportunity. Let me know what you think in the comments if you think going with the original ending would have been the superior choice or going with the theatrical ending was the right call. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of One Fatal Flaw. I have yet to decide what film I am going to analyze on the next episode, so y'all will just have to wait and see. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, consider supporting me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time.